With the renaissance of heritage acts and the emergence of digital downloads and streaming, the Spotify figures for 80s hit makers, the raw band, had slowly been growing year on year. And by the January the 20, uh, 2022, were comfortably sitting on an average of 12,000 streams a day. Then suddenly, the daily figures started to jump all the way up to 100,000 plus daily streams within a month. And the band hadn't had a hit for well over 30 years. The trail led to TikTok, where Messages from the Stars, which is a lesser known track from 1983, was being used as the audio for a huge volume of users generated videos. To this day, no one knows how the trend began, but with some big hitters used to the tune to back their viral videos, which had been shared or repurposed by hundreds of thousands of TikTok users, um, it was quite a phenomenon. As the song got more screen time, the more people searched for it, and on other platforms such as YouTube, etc. Within six months, the track started appearing in the charts around the world, peaking at number six in the USA viral charts on Spotify, alongside the star which is kate bush thanks to her stranger things phenomenon to date messages from the stars has gained over 300 million streams across all platforms and currently has 5 million monthly streams on spotify alone and the man behind the phenomenal group the raw band richard anthony houston joins us now Welcome. Hi there. Hi, that's frightening. Those figures are frightening, aren't they? <laughs> 300 million. I mean, that's the size of a large country. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes. It is, isn't it? Amazing. What was it like waking up to um, to all of those, you know, the popularity of these songs, uh, making it into the Spotify shots and all of those downloads? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the sort of thing you can't make up. I mean, you could, you could promote all you like, but what happens is some kids in Los Angeles picked it up. Um, and and just turned it into a you know the, that's how it goes over there. They have an influencer. You know, some guy says, "Hey, you gotta listen to the messenger from the stars," and they all pick on it and go. It, it's amazing. It's quite amazing. Your dotage to be getting three hundred million hits. <laughs> I bet it is. Now, many people will may not know this, but your musical life began in the Merchant Navy as a cadet in your teens. And it was during this time you discovered jazz while listening to Willis uh, Conover's Jazz Hour on your shortwave radio. On one of your naval expeditions, the previous occupant of his cabin had left a guitar behind. Could you tell us the story about that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I was, um, I, I came to music very late, really, because I hadn't done music. I went straight from school into the Merchant Navy as a kid about 16 and um, loved it, you know, for, for a couple of years. But as you said, uh, the guy left, the previous occupant of my cabin left his guitar behind. And I thought, well, you know, because you've got a lot of time off at sea sitting on the deck in the tropics. Yeah. looking at the stars, <laughs> uh, I'd go and get a guitar and um, teach myself to play. So I rushed ashore, bought a book, How to Play Guitar, etc. And as you said, I, I listened to Willis, Willis Connor's um, Jazz Hour program, which was broadcast from Voice of America on shortwave, because we, of course, didn't have any internet or anything like no. that then. So it, it was um, shortwave radio listening to that, and I got really into jazz. You know, I was getting quite good on the old guitar because I had plenty of time to practice. And um, I, I got so good that I thought, really, I want to give a go to it. Um, and, I, and I left the Merchant Navy after a couple and a half years, two and a half years, and came ashore, as they call it, and um, got a job as a lab assistant just to fill the day, yeah. and practice, 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 and got some gigs in the, on the old jazz guitar, which uh, I got better and better. Even got so good I could play in Ronnie Scott's club in, in London, you know. Wow. Then I went to, after that, I, I decided to, broaden the music um, from jazz, even though I was a total jazz head. We, yes. But I went to college. Uh, I managed to get a, a grant to go to the Guildhall School of Music, where I studied orchestration. So um, after that, I came out and uh, was a professional musician, which was quite a change from the Merchant Navy at 15 or 16 years old. By then, um, I'd only been 18 or something. 
Yes, I bet it was such a change because you studied classical composition, piano and trumpet, and you graduated in the late 60s. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. It's probably about 67 or something like that, 68, um, <clears throat> and got the first gig as an arra professional arranger. And I don't know whether you know the, the story, but what happened was I met a guy called Peter Asher, who was a who was a Peter and Gordon fame. Yes, yes, a world anyway, without love. Yeah, that's it, a world without world. Done. Anyway, he um, was a bass player, and and we had a little group, and we used to go around to Peter's house to uh, to rehearse, you know, to uh, tunes and whatnot. And his sister Jane Asher was going out with Paul McCartney at the time, so hence there was a connection. I yes. got to meet him. And then Paul uh, discovered Mary Hopkin. Now, she was a Welsh folk singer who had made it on Opportunity Knocks, you know, with Huey Green. Yes. <laughs> we yes. want to hear it. We want to hear it. <laughs> and uh, she, she, um, he wanted to make a, a record with her, but he wanted to be a bit different, not, not, to, not the usual kind of pop records, because I didn't know anything about pop music. I was a jazz musician. Yes. And, through, yeah. and then trained, trained sorry, that's my mother, but, and then trained in orchestration. Um, so I knew nothing about pop music, and so that's great. Paul said, that's what I want. I want somebody to do it. He's not going to make a, a record like everybody else's records around with the same arrangers. So I just did my, what I thought was an orchestration, and lo and behold, it, they hated it at first, funny thing. Funny thing is that Mary Hopkin and Paul, when they first heard it, they said, oh, my God, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they took it back to EMI Studios and put it up, and they said, hey, this is really great, different, very really different. So it went out and it became number one around the world. Of course, then I got lots of gigs doing arranging. And of course, that was, and it was with Those Were The Days. That was the tune, indeed it was. Yeah, yeah. which was an instant uh, number one hit. And even today, when you play it on the radio, it's timeless. It's it is, fantastic. It? Yeah. yeah, it is. And that, that was my first job as an arranger. So, of course, I got lots of calls from Welsh girls, folk singers, <laughs> <laughs> but also some big stars. And, and that's how it went. So I did arranging then for about oh, eight, nine years before I sort of woke up, as it were. And you've back. worked with, you followed, um, you've also followed things up after the success with Mary Hopkin with working with uh, James Taylor on his debut album and then yeah. the iconic string section in the Beatles' Long and Winding Road. Now, I've heard that um, Sir Paul McCartney, <laughs> as he is now, yeah, I mean, was not best say, pleased but, yeah. about the stripped back Long and Winding Road. Could you yeah. tell us about that story? I certainly would. I told it a few times, but it's a, it's a strange old story. It is a long and winding story. What happened was that John and Paul, at, at that time, coming to the end of their love affair, as it were, and they, yeah. they, were, they, they really split up. And John went off, and, and they'd finished the Let It Be album, <clears throat> and, but John wasn't happy with it or something like that. So he called Alan Klein, a new manager from America, to come in and... and what he called clean up the album, try and make it more presentable. So Alan Klein, in his wisdom, called Phil Spector. Now, Phil Spector is the wall of sound man. Yes, you know, he, he is, he yes. Huge orchestras, 20 violins, 20 trumpets, whatever. So he called him in and he said, um, Phil, can you clean up this album? So Phil Spector got hold of me because he'd heard that I was a director. And he said, um, Richard, I want, a, I want a big orchestra on this. And I thought, oh, okay, that's fine. I love doing big orchestras. It's not fun. And uh, not knowing that Paul McCartney hadn't sanctioned it at all. I didn't know that he didn't know about it. So I just went along with it. And, um, and I did a big arrangement. And not only strings, it was brass, choir, harps. <laughs> I mean, a big orchestra. I mean, it's great fun to do. And, of course, we did it. I mean, when we did it, God knows how many takes I did of it with Phil Spectre sitting in the box saying nothing. And then he just said, OK, that's good. And off we went. The next thing I heard was um, that Paul McCartney went bananas. I never <laughs> wanted an, uh, he never wanted an arrangement on it. He wanted to be just the original piano demo kind of thing with, with Ringo and the drummer uh, and a bass player. But um, <laughs> off it went. And funny enough, it was never released here. It right. went to straight to America and was a massive hit. Massive hit. So next time I saw Paul, because he did forgive me, <laughs> I worked <laughs> quite a lot after that. I said, hey, Paul, didn't do too bad after all, did it? <laughs> <laughs> 
excellent that is an excellent story and um you know with with that song it's just so beautiful and with the with the with the strings it's wonderful and of course phil specter he didn't do half measures did he i mean he did with every project that he did it was always that big wall of sound especially when he did the uh righteous brothers you've lost that love and feeling did the yeah, similar yes. thing there with uh long and winding road exactly so i don't know whether they knew that he was going to do that but uh, certainly paul didn't <laughs> but i think actually you know, i heard later that he did go on tour and use the scaled down version of that arrangement so <laughs> and what what that. did it sound like when he did the when he had the playback in the studio there was that at emi um, it, did you say it was emi yeah, i'd be wrong um it, at, in number one the big studio you know the big uh, main studio yes and yes. It, it sounded incredible because we had so many musicians in there and you and they're all brilliant players i mean the session players um you know they're the top of their game and you yes. put music in front of them they'll play whatever you put in front of them perfectly first time and in fact we did i, I as i remember we just kept on doing take after take and film and it was perfect every time because these yes. just played perfectly and phil didn't say anything didn't say anything and eventually i think we all got a bit fed up and said well look you know we can't do any more we're going home so we did <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, fabulous. So did you use the first take? I can't remember which one it was we took, but they were all perfect. So anyone would have done. So. But <laughs> I think that was just being Phil Spector being Phil Spector, you know. But he must have just loved the tune. Yeah, he probably did. <laughs> <laughs> Play it again, Sam. <laughs> Play it again, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now, you've worked with some of the best musicians and singers, including Diana Ross, the Bee Gees, Carly Simon, Toya Wilcox, Fleetwood Mac, Herbie Hancock, Art Garfunkel, I'll take a breath, <laughs> Dupa Tramp, Leo Sia, Chris Ria, and many, many more. What was it like working with these now iconic stars, as you will have had a hand in them being stars? Yeah, well, when you mention the American stars, um, quite often um, they basically sent me a vocal with a piano or something like that, and I worked on it from my end in London, and then sent it back, put the orchestra on and sent it back because of the right. logistics of being there. But quite a few times I went over to Los Angeles anyway, with Supertramp, their last album, I did that one in los angeles that was a, an experience and wow a, yeah that was it and then it, art garfunkel came over to london and and um carly simon well marvin hamlish came over to london to do the spy who loved me track right. which was um uh that song that um nobody does it, that's it thank you for just yeah it's the, it's the one that it's says the, the spy who loved me there. that's it yeah exactly right well done <laughs> but um marvin was there for that but she wasn't she sent her voice again on the tape so right. the american guys are mostly i met a lot but but quite a few didn't come over i did it from my end and then sent it back though i did go there sometimes to see various people it's amazing how uh, the, how the industry was back then because obviously in the digital age now you can actually especially with um you know when we had all the lockdowns and things um mm. we had people collaborating from all over the world you know making music together yeah, playing yeah. at the same time but back exactly. then it was a case of right that vocal's going to be coming on a f on a plane yeah carry exactly. to the studio yeah, yeah. add and it on mix yeah. it master yeah, it yeah. exactly <laughs> so that was that, that was exactly how it worked a very very primitive way of what they're doing now obviously it's all electronic now, so you can do it instantly like this but um over uh, you know, back uh, back in the 80s or late 70s and um, it, it, right up to then it was all tape i mean i have a 24 track machine here which i used all the way through the 80s which i still it's a bit rumbly now but it's right. you know it is i've got a shed out in the back with 124 track tapes of wow work over the years you know and Amazing. it's all on tape magnetic tape which actually you have to strange thing about magnetic tape is after a few years 
it deteriorates such that you have to bake it. That's the way they revive the old tapes. Oh, that's a right. Funny, a funny story about that, which is um, I, I wanted to get something off one of the 24 tracks, so I put it in the oven, but I forgot what temperature you're supposed to do it at. So oh. it's an American company that does it. So I rang them up, hey, uh, what temperature do I put this in for my oven to bake it back? He said, oh, 120 degrees. I said, mm, sounds a bit hot, but anyway, uh -huh. okay. So I put it in the oven. Oh, you're frozen. 120 degrees. And I thought, sitting there, it smells a bit strong. <laughs> I opened <laughs> the oven and it all crumpled up, melted. What oh. I've made a mistake is that you do, do Fahrenheit, we do centigrade. And I should have oh. put it in centigrade, which is 50 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have a, did you have, was that, that wasn't your master tape, was it? It was the master, but luckily I had a, a, a master reduced master. I can't remember which track it was. It wasn't that important, but uh, it just I, I learned a quick lesson there. Oh, <laughs> so Fahrenheit yes. in America, centigrade in England. Well, That's right. Yeah. Don't over bake your tape. Don't over bake your tapes. Good matter. Good motto. <laughs> Leave that to the record bakers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The record bakers. <laughs> Hey, that's a great story. Maybe I'm not meant to be laughing. <laughs> oh, yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you've produced that much music, it's absolutely amazing. And I bet you would take. I bet you've got years and years and years worth that you can still release. Yeah, well, indeed, um, we have got now a second box set, which is out now called Clouds Cross and The first one came out in October last year which was like the first part of the but the Ra Bat story when i started with the crunch and went up to the Ra album and going up and then the next out the box set which is out now covers the period from clouds across the moon which was 1985 on to today effectively with a lot of material which has never even been heard you know there's i think it's 58 tracks or something like that made wow 78 no 78 tracks or something enormous amount of music on that um, box set which is if you're a fan you know it, it covers stuff that you may have never heard before and remixes of the old things so it's, it's you know if you fancy that oh yes excellent well we're going to pick up from that a little bit later on and tell listeners about the box set and such like because i'm going to take you back to 1977 where you formed your legendary synth boogie outfit the raw band of which were you were the sole member yeah in which you took right. its name from your initials the raw band went to, on to have a string of hit pop records kicking off with what you mentioned earlier on there was the debut instrumental the crunch in 1977 which climbed to number six in the uk top 40 and you played all the instruments yourself the arrangement didn't use synthesizers only conventional guitar and keyboards with pedal effects what was it like your first attempt at making music with your guitar and keyboard with pedal effects at first yeah well that, as you say um, a lot of people said oh what a great synth sound on that record that i made and i said, I said no it wasn't because i didn't even have a synth in those days i was still a jazz musician at heart so i was a, i was a guitar player by trade and uh I, because of guitar you could play basses similar and i had a, a keyboard electric keyboard a very early electric keyboard called a home piano it was a funny old thing anyway it worked and what I did to change, because I didn't want to use the sounds of that, because I was moving, I was hoping to do, you know, something a bit more glam rock, if you like, at the time it was. And I put all the instruments through guitar pedals and right. overdrove them, overdrove them by making it too loud. And that's why they came out sort of crunchy, crunchy yes. sound. And now the name Crunch came about, of course. So that was... Um, not not synth in sight though a lot of people said well, you must have had a synth no i got a synth given to me by roland after that was a hit <laughs> that right. got me into doing synth music properly you know electronic music but that was that was the first record um, done in the bedroom literally i was a bedroom band man. wow that's amazing absolutely amazing when you had uh, recorded your first track what did the family think of it my family yeah <laughs> Not a lot. They were only tiny babies, probably. They were, you know, they, they, no, I suppose they were four or five years. Oh, I mean, I said, oh, Dad, well, if they could speak, I can't even remember whether they could speak at that point. Um, they were only, only kids, but, yeah, they jumped about. i tell you what, the, the only 
<laughs> we lived in a village in, in Surrey, and um, you get kids standing on the side of the road because they knew where I lived, you see, fatal mistake. And they stand on the roof going, da 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 yeah, that was funny. The village people, you know, picking up on it. We moved shortly after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, th that particular track's been used in television commercials as well, hasn't it? The crunch. It has been. Um, it has been. I think it um, the first before it became released as a record. I think it was on a jeans commercial. I think. Oh that right. Was it was actually pressed and put out as a record because it took quite a while. I remember, I made the record in probably seventy or something like that and tried to walk it round if nobody was interested and then I think probably because it got on that commercial it got more attention and I could I got it released uh, which wow. was probably two years after I met. excellent now a number of jazz funk releases followed in the early 80s for the raw yeah. band as well as the lesser known messages from the stars which i mentioned at the top of the interview in 1983 messages mm -hmm. from the stars um charted as high well it got into the top 50. how did it feel with your first chart success well that <coughs> that was me changing from uh, i think it was the second record i did with a vocal on because up to then being jazz up, just played i uh, didn't sort of go for vocals i didn't know about music or how to write pop songs or anything like that i was just still a jazz player at heart yes but then um i wanted to broaden the horizons a bit and i thought well really i've got to you know if i'm going to make any royalties i've, I've got to a song or two you know because or, as i explained it earlier arrangers don't get royalties you don't you just get the beat the one yeah. the beat, um and that's it so i thought right i'm going to write to a song and the first one i did actually um was called perfume garden that was just before messages from the start perfume garden did well but the thing was what when I made it, I just made a track and I wrote, wrote some simple words, come with me, and the ride, et cetera. I just, I just wrote, you know, I'm not a great lyric writer, but I thought, Could anybody do this, I'll just sit. And I used to write yeah. it in the bath with a paper and pencil. Right. And um, I hadn't got anybody to sing it. So then I thought, well, my, my then wife um, was a brilliant musician and pianist and could sing anything she could sing at sight you know anything you put in front of her she would be able to sing it right so i wrote my little words out for her to sing and she came in put me just down and came in and have a look at this see if you can sing this for me and she did and i said that's great it'll be to do as a demo you know and then i can get a real singer yes and more i thought anyway this has got a sort of quaint naive type of sound to it and, and i thought why don't we try sell it as it is? Same land. That same thing happened on Messages from the Stars. And I took it around and picked, they picked it up and out it went. And it did. Both of those tunes got into the top 40 and uh, did okay. But then yeah. it's just uh, the rest of it is history, the later dates, you know. That's right, because the second big hit single was in 1985 with Clouds Across the Moon, which also reached number six in the UK Top 40, featuring vocals from your wife at the time, Liz, Dizzy Liz Hewson. What was it like putting a group together to perform on Top of the Pops? Uh -huh. Well, here we go. The, with the crunch, I don't know whether you know that story, but the, the story, the first time we talked, went on top of the box with the crunch you know the one in 77 yes uh, but it wasn't me <laughs> what had happened was back in those days in top of the box in 77 i think it was robin nash who was the producer if I remember it, he insisted everybody play live on the show yes now i couldn't do it because i'd already been booked for an arrangement or something on, on that day that you had to do top of the box. so um Somehow they found these guys where, well, where they found them, I don't know, because they couldn't really play very well. And it, it, the sound, if you listen to the actual original uh, video, it's nothing like the record. And these guys came in with plastic bin bags on and things in there. <laughs> nothing like me. Anyway, it, it went on top of the box and it got into the charts. And then we, with, when we came to do um, Clouds Across the Moon, the, the rules had changed, which was lucky, because then it wasn't Robin Nash, it was somebody else, I can't remember who went on. Anyway, he said they, they'd rather do it, uh, lip sync it to the original track. Right. You know, to make sure the sound was exactly like that, yeah. which is what happened on uh, 
and that's what's the move. We lip sync it and, and I play the piano and all that stuff. But in fact, that my wife then just lip synced it, didn't record it because that the root right. of the top had changed. Wow, and it looked amazing with the. I, I, I had a look at the um, top of the pops appearance um, just before you uh, invited me on the show, and um, you look quite comfortable there with all, with your keyboards in the background there. Just you know, just doing the bits. But the funny thing was having that um, Robbie the robot in. Is that I'm not sure if she's on the top of the pops one. It's one of the videos because we did Soul Train as well and another right. of Top of Pops. And Robbie the robot the, was the guy who was a robot robot dancer at the time. Oh yes, that's and right. He, he did this thing, which he hadn't worked about. Where he, in his act, he, he has a firework in his head in a, in a thing. And, <laughs> and at the crucial point in the song, he let the firework off, and the fire department went bananas. They were off. <laughs> just like, ah. <laughs> so uh, that was, you know, that was quite a surprise for everybody. Maybe helped to set the record, didn't it? Excellent. Now, how did you feel appearing on Top of the Pops at the time after working so hard since 1977? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose it, it was a novelty for me because, as I told you, I was out jazz all, all through through. Didn't have anything to do with pop music. I did my orchestrations, which I loved. But my pop career, that was the sort of pinnacle of it at the time. That definitely was. So it's a real novelty to be on telly. You know, and I've been on telly, really. I had in the background, but not as a, as the featured artist, so to speak. So it was great. It was great fun, you know. In those days, the television was quite you had massive, great cameras, you know, not like neat little ones now. Huge cables in the studio; they kept tripping over. I bet. It was, it was, it was quite primitive, really, compared to today. But it worked. It worked, and it it looked a great atmosphere as well there uh, on top of the pops. A great party atmosphere. Oh, was they? I mean, they all had a party afterwards, and, 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 and it's funny the way the floor managers moved the crowd around because it's not as big as, as you think. When you see it on telly, it looks big, but it's not. It's quite a small room, and they have the bands in different corners. So when you come to the next tune, the, the floor manager had to herd everybody over there, <laughs> and <laughs> tripping over the wires and. <laughs> I, they wouldn't allow it now with health and safety. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Right, we're going to go bang up to date now because uh, a mind-blowing, unexpected surge in popularity has occurred, as I mentioned earlier, um, since 2022 for the Raw Band with the 1983 anthem Message from the Stars becoming a viral sensation on TikTok. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, peaking at number six in the US viral charts that summer alongside Kate Bush. Um, unbelievably, um, all these years on, um, you've managed to fit all of your hits, as it were, on CD. And it's like I mentioned earlier on, it's a box set and it's also got um, inlay cards as well, which describes the songs. Yeah, that's very true. There's a nice, um, Lois Wilson did uh, great sleeve notes on, there are two box sets out. I think I mentioned before the Crunch one and the, the Clouds Across the Moon one. Mm -hmm. And um, they've done a brilliant job. I mean, Cherry Red Records it is, but they've really made a nice job of it. The packaging is solid. It's not one of these flimsy things that you sometimes get on box sets. You know, it's a real solid cardboard pack. I think they call it a clam box or something. Yes, anyway, it's really, right. really hard. And, and it's got lovely designs and the artwork and, and everything and, and all the photographs they put in there. Photographs I haven't seen, remember seeing for years and years and years. So it's a, a couple of very good packages, well worth any modern time getting a copy of those. Now, going to a live act that you performed on the 11th of June 2022 history was made as the raw band performed live for the first time in over 40 years to a packed out crowd at the jazz cafe in London what was it like performing live that was great actually by the, the, my son who is a brilliant musician now uh, you know he, he's, he's they're so clever the kids today we're hardly a kid he's in his 30s but he took over and what happened was we got invited to, to do a live band because I don't think the jazz cafe people knew that it wasn't really a band. And, you know, right. So they invited the rock band to come and play at the jazz cafe last uh, June. Um, 
June 22. And um, I said, well, I don't know how we're going to do this because it was only me playing the instruments and then overdubbing strings and etc. bits like that. I said, I don't know how we can do it. So Dan said, my son Dan, he said, uh, well, why don't I put some of my mates together, my musician friends, and, and do it like that, live, you know, the rather than live. And I said, okay, go for that. Wow. So he did, and it, it was amazing. He, he actually um, transcribed all the scores, you know, the, for the show, and wrote all the parts out for the guys, and they're all brilliant players anyway. And three great girls, singers, came in and did all the, all the vocals. And it went down a storm, and the place was packed, and, and we're doing another one this um, coming autumn on the 25th of November at the Omira Club, apparently. I've never been there, but... Oh, the Omira Club. Be. Okay, yes. Yeah, I don't know it myself, but um, I will then. <laughs> you will then, yes. Yeah. And you, can you tell me um, where people can get a copy of uh, your music today? What, the... Um, the box sets. The box sets. Yeah. Well, if you if you go Cherry Red Records and get in touch with them, they that's where they originate. Or you can get it through if you go to the Raband website, for instance, www.raband.com. Um, all the info's on there too. Or if you look at the YouTube, if you, any Raband stuff, it's usually on there. How to get tickets for the Mirror Plus, how to get the records, all that info certainly on. Uh, Rabat.com, that would definitely be the place to go if you want to find about the merch. It's also just merchandise and stuff like that. And do you have a particular tune that you've put, that you've actually written that is your go-to track if you were going to, you know, say that this is my sing song that I want to perform today? Um, I think they're all different. I get often that question asked um, before about which one is is your absolute favorite and i don't really i can't they all have a different character and a different history to them i mean obviously clouds across the moon is probably the most famous one but then now messages from the stars is maybe more famous than that in america anyway um so you know each one has its own character and its own history story behind it so hard to say which one very hard very hard to say because they're all treasures they're all your babies they're all your babies. Excellent. Do you have any future projects coming up other than the uh, live event that's coming up in the pipeline? Well, we have, uh, as I said, the Amira concert coming up in November. Um, there's a new record which I've just finished, um, which topically is um, referring to climate change, called One Day We'll Smile Again. Now, that one is a new vocalist that I've discovered, sung by Bella Hutton. She's a brilliant, brilliant girl. And that's out on YouTube before it comes out on record. So that is, if you go to YouTube and put one day by the rock and you'll see it. And, and it's it, it, a lot of people really like this tune because not only is it topical, and we're very strong, feel very strongly about the whole thing, being country people living in, in modern nature, you know, we feel strong about it. So that is next year. And also there's a lot of other materials, a new electronic album, I made coming out uh, quite a lot, a lot of records due out for 2024. Wow, well, we'll have to keep an eye on your website for details on that, yeah, okay. and that's yeah, the yeah. rawband.com. That's it, the rawband. That's it. And I've been on the website, and there is merchandise on there as well as the CDs yeah. and things. Sure, so sure. it, you know, it really um, there is something for everyone on the rawband.com website. Now the vinyl revival is upon us, Richard. So it means that I've I've, I've just got to ask a question: um, What is your favourite vinyl single and album that you have ever bought? I would say, again, it's difficult to pick one. But when I was a jazz player, I was mad about Jim Hall, the guitar player, long dead now, but as being a jazz player, he was amazing. And I've got one of my favorite records of his was Jim Hall and Sonny Rollins, a great jazz sax player. And I would say out of all the records I ever bought, that's one. But then again, you see, you, you, you get the, I'd start to think more now. I think, oh, what about that one? What about that one? And it's really hard again to pick out one single one. I would say that one is one, certainly one of the best. One of the best for you there. Well, Richard, it has been an absolute 
pleasure having you on the show and i'd like to wish you all the best with your future music and gigs and finally would it be possible for you to introduce your number six single in the uk top 40 clouds across uh, clouds across the moon yeah well this is clouds across the moon from 1985 by the raw band richard thank you so much for joining me on the show Thank you for having me. A great pleasure. No problem. All the best. And to you. How are you? How are you then? <laughs>